Hello, my name is Hashem El Sarag. I'm a professor and a chair of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. I would like to thank the organizers for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you briefly about hepatocellular carcinoma arising in the setting of NAFLD and or NASH. So I would like to start my talk by uh, bringing hepatocellular carcinoma into the context of globesity, which is the global pandemic of obesity where the United States leads the world in the incidence and prevalence of obesity, but a lot or many other regions in the world are uh, coming along with this obesity pandemic. The dark areas indicate uh, where the prevalence of BMI greater than 30 um, is more than 30% or so. Uh, as you can see, your areas of the world may not be the highest, but it's certainly second highest. If you're an alarmist, if you would like to portray a worst case scenario, there's this New England Journal of Medicine that shows that the incidence or the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma is increased disproportionately compared to other cancers among men with a BMI greater than 35. So in this longitudinal cohort study, it shows that the risk of almost all cancers are increased, as you can tell by the names and the bars here, but the one at the very top highlighted in orange is the risk of liver cancer, 4.52, double the risk of other cancers. However, if you look at the totality of the picture, it shows that the association between obesity and the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma is generally inconsistent and of much lower magnitude than the slide that I've shown earlier. So in this meta-analysis of several observational studies, it shows that the conglomerate or aggregate risk here is around 1.8 to 1.2 uh, for obesity, and it's not statistically significant for overweight as defined by BMI greater than 25. So most but not all studies suggest an increase in the risk of HCC with obesity, and the relative risk is relatively low. So why is that the case? I would like to introduce the concept of distal versus proximal associations. Obesity is a distal condition measured by BMI, which does not capture or may not capture what's so harmful about obesity in terms of causing cancer. And it's becoming very common. So a common nonspecific entity, try to tie it with liver cancer and you may get weak and inconsistent findings. So therefore, what might be useful is to look at more proximal associations, such as diabetes, abdominal obesity, humoral mechanisms, medications, intermediate lesions like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and or its complication, NASH, and or genetic factors. And the more I'm gonna examine with you, you examine proximal conditions, the more likely you will understand the association between obesity and liver cancer, and you will understand the determinants of these associations. So let's move on to abdominal obesity as opposed to BMI. There have been few studies, some of them population-based cohort studies, that examined waist circumference as a surrogate for abdominal obesity. In this particular European multi-country population-based study called EPIC, it has shown that people with a waist-hip ratio in the highest tertile of the population had the highest risk of HCC with a threefold elevation. Similar findings were found in other studies using waist-hip ratio. So notice three is much larger than 1.8 to two. So here we're finding more consistent association between abdominal obesity and stronger association between abdominal obesity and the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. This was meant to be a joke, and the picture here was supposed to be me before going on diet and exercise, and I wanted to surprise the audience by telling them that currently I look uh, uh, very different from this. I look like this. Uh, both are exaggerated. So what's the key about abdominal obesity? Abdominal obesity is a reflection of the compartments of fat within the abdomen. 
And there are two major compartments. One is subcutaneous, that is thought to be an inert, non-active fat. And one is visceral, that is supposed to work as a source of systemic inflammation, as well as some sort of an endocrine organ with lots of metabolic activity. So hypothetical cross sections among or between two individuals, both have identical BMI, 31 in this graph, both have identical actually circumference of the waist, but they have different distributions of fat. The one on the left has a lot more subcutaneous and a lot less visceral, while the one on the right has the opposite. I'm not gonna read through the numbers, but the one on the right has a highly abnormal metabolic profile indicative of insulin resistance, elevated triglycerides, low HDL, while the person on the left looks metabolically normal. So here, what I'm trying to make the point, that's why the studies may find inconsistent association because the measures that these studies are looking at, be it BMI or even waist circumference, may hide a lot of individual variations. And depending on the population you study, you may end up with people with a lot of visceral fat or people with a lot of subcutaneous fat, and that would change the associations. So if you look deeper or more proximal into inflammatory cytokines or adipokines, then studies are looking, still inconsistent, but finding some associations. For example, IL-6 in this particular study found to be a risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma. So now I'm gonna move. So we talked about abdominal obesity, we talked about waist hip ratio, we talked about visceral obesity, we talked about uh, cytokines as indicators of visceral obesity. Now I'm gonna talk about diabetes as a reflection of this metabolic syndrome slash obesity. Years ago, we've conducted a retrospective cohort study among veterans in the US, 173,000 veterans with type two diabetes, were compared to a matched group of non-diabetics, almost three, four times the number. And the y-axis shows the HCC rate. The x-axis shows follow-up up to 14 years. And the risk of HCC is doubled among those with type 2 diabetes compared to those without diabetes. Since that time, many studies have been done. In one meta-analysis slash systematic review, a total of 25 observational cohort studies were examined, 18 of which showed a positive association, and the aggregate uh, risk, uh, relative risk was around two, identical to our original study. So the conclusion from this, type 2 diabetes is associated with a two-fold elevation in the relative risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So now I'm gonna to move to another explanation for this phenomenon, which gets me closer to the topic here, which is NAFLD-NASH. So it's no secret that the prevalence of NAFLD is very, very high, almost worldwide. This slide shows the prevalence of NASH in the general population in the uh, uh, higher square and in type two diabetes in the lower square in each area of the world. And you can see that the, the prevalence is 20 to 30% in general and up to 70% among patients with type 2 diabetes. So it's a very common condition. Uh, many studies have been done trying to examine the natural history of this condition. Most of the studies have been based on retrospective uh, cohort studies and case control studies that are based in the clinics which biases your estimates. But the studies show in general, 20 to 25% of NAFLD could move into NASH and 11 to 12% of NASH would move to cirrhosis over 10 to 15 years. Then cirrhosis would move to HCC around one to 1.5% 1 per year. Um, but there are the red arrows here where there's a small proportion that would move directly from NAFL to HCC and a small proportion that would move directly from NASH to HCC. As I mentioned, this study is not, uh, this slide is not based on one study, but it's based on estimates gathered from the literature that is generally not fantastic. 
So what I'm gonna share with you, what I consider really a fantastic study because it's a cohort study, it has longitudinal follow-up, it's more or less a population study. It's mostly primary care population, national VA database, almost half a million patients identified with NAFLD as defined by elevated liver enzymes and the absence of other major causes matched to an equal number of individuals without NAFLD. So this is your most basic comparison that addresses the question, does NAFLD of any shape or form predisposed to liver cancer compared to someone without NAFLD? And the answer was a resounding yes. So it's almost a seven-fold increase in the incidence of HCC among NAFLD all comers compared to controls without known liver disease. Notice one thing here, the low number of cases. So 727 cases only in half a million over 9.1 year follow-up. So the rate is 0.2 per 1,000. It is almost 10 times higher as the rate in non-NAFLD. But at least it serves the basic question that it is a relatively important condition, but absolutely it's a small number of cases. So if you dig deeper, who among this group of massive half a million patients with NAFL developed HCC, you find few indicators of determinants of risk. Those who had diabetes had a higher risk than non-diabetes. Those who were older than 65 had higher risk than the younger ages. Those who are Latinos, and this is a US study, were had a higher risk than the other two racial ethnic groups. And importantly, those who had a high Feb4 indicative of cirrhosis and or a diagnosis of cirrhosis had by far the highest incidence rates. Remember what I mentioned early, it was 0.2 per 1,000 person years overall. But if you look at cirrhosis, it's almost 20. It's tenfold higher than the rest of the NAFL group. So what does the study say? NAFLD in general, is associated with an elevated HCC risk. Doesn't help you that much because there are so many NAFL people. If you narrow it down, then the cirrhosis group is the one group with a distinctly high HCC risk. Well, what else is important? Turns out to be the metabolic dysfunction traits are important and the more you accumulate of them, the higher the risk of the HCC. So if you go to the end of this graph here, those who have dyslipidemia, hypertension, diabetics, and a BMI of 30 have a adjusted ha hazard ratio of eight compared to the rest of the NAFLs. So we learned a few things from the study. HCC risk is elevated in general. Those, if you stratify them by cirrhosis and metabolic risk factors, you get to a group or subgroups where the risk is meaningfully elevated. I alluded three slides ago to this entity where NAFL and or NASH go directly to HCC without passing through cirrhosis. How true this entity is? We've examined this in our study in the VA, 1,500 patients consecutively presenting with HCC. We looked at the underlying cirrhosis through a thorough systematic review of the records, looking for evidence, histologic, radiologic, biochemical, clinical. And we classified them as highly probably non-cirrhosis, meaning someone got a liver biopsy, or just highly probably non-cirrhosis, meaning they had no other feature of cirrhosis, although they didn't have a liver biopsy. So in general, one can find that those who had an underlying etiology of NAFLD, almost a third had either highly probable or very highly probable no cirrhosis. That's quite different from hepatitis C, where it's only 8.9%, hep B, 7.7%, and alcoholic liver disease, 11.1%. Well, who were those unlucky people in the green bar? Those were the ones who are much more likely to be NAFLD or to have a metabolic syndrome defined by diabetes or uh, obesity. So my conclusion from this is 10 to 13% of HCC patients, at least in the VA system, and in other studies, as high as 20% of cases that, of HCC that develop in a background 
of Nafold or Nash develop in the absence of frank cirrhosis. So what are the mechanisms for that? No one knows. Obviously, while it's a small proportion, it's an important proportion because the underlying denominator is very large. So obesity and diabetes seem to be independent risk factors for this entity. So it has something maybe has something to do with uh, the metabolic uh, pathways related to obesity and diabetes. There are case series of hepatic adenoma with malignant transformation, but the number is large that it leads me to think it, it couldn't be hepatic adenoma as the primary mover. Uh, and it's a, certainly an area that is alarming and of, of a major interest because there are no clinical parameters that would allow you to identify those patients. So genetic factors, there is the uh, several GWAS studies. I've identified this gene, PNPLA3, and this variant or polymorphism, RS738409, has been associated with an increased risk of HCC. Uh, this variant is, uh, high, carries a high risk for developing NAFL, for more advanced NAFL, for cirrhosis related to NAFL, and for liver cancer. Biologically, it's associated with increased liver fat, increased ALT, and it's not associated with BMI, insulin-resistant plasma triglyceride, or cholesterol. And this is what it shows that uh, having that uh, polymorphism is associated with 2.3 to 2.7 uh, uh, relative risk uh, compared to those who have the other variant. So where does your area of the world fall? This is Taiwan. Um, the distribution of the dark red here is the uh, dark uh, blue, I meant, is the RS738409. Um, and you can see where you are, okay? And this is the distribution in the population. So clearly, the more the po underlying population would have the bad variant, like Latinos in the US. You notice Latinos here is almost 50 50. They're at a much higher risk of developing HCC than African Americans, where it's uh, 80 20. And in Taiwan, it's somewhere in between. Actually, it's in the bad variety, if you will. So if you didn't like NAFLD, wait until you're about MAFLD. The problem with NAFLD, if you had a treated hepatitis B or a cured hepatitis C, you couldn't be called NAFLD because you had another cause. If you were drinking moderately, you couldn't be called NAFLD because you had some drinking of alcohol. And clearly biology doesn't work in a mutually exclusive way. So one way to get around it is to define for things by what they are as opposed to what they are not. So there's this push for another definition or perhaps of a different entity, but useful nevertheless. Uh, the presence of hepatic steatosis combined with either type two diabetes or with overweight qualify people to get maffled and even if they're lean, they, need to, they can have more metabolic risk abnormalities that qualify them to MAFLD. And with this parameter, MAFLD could affect a billion people. So I wanna put it in a bigger picture and I wanna use US numbers, but you can use any country you want and the, the, the analogies stand true. Old risk factors are hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Even in areas where they're common, they're not very common in the US it's 0.5 to 1%. In some areas of the world, they're probably 5%, even 10%. Hepatitis C, 1 to 2%, and unless it's Egypt where it's 10%, most countries have single digits. These are highly virulent risk factors. The risk estimate is 20 to 25. So if you take a low prevalence with a high risk estimate, you end up with a population attributable fraction that is decent, 20 to 25. But these entities are dropping. Hepatitis B, there's vaccination, and hepatitis C, um, uh, testing uh, blood supplies have dropped it. The risk estimate, even if the infection is there, have dropped because of effective treatments for hepatitis B with adequate HBV suppression, and for C because of achievement of SVR. So that results in a major drop in the population attributable fraction, while entities like MAFLD affect 30 to 40% of the population. They're very weak risk factors. They're 1.5 to only 2.5, but because they're very common, their population attributable fraction is quite large, okay? 
So models, mathematical models, suggest that while it's not currently the most important cause of hepatocellular carcinoma in the US or in any other country, by 2030, at least in this model, a quarter of the NAFLD will be NASHAs and the, ins the, the projected uh, excess death by 2030 would be high. And another model actually shows in the US that it will be 40% uh, of all HCC cases uh, could be related to advanced NASH. So based on everything I said, assuming that the attributable fraction for hep C and hep B continues to decline, assuming metabolic dysfunction traits continue as bad as they are, uh, and there is no treatment, makes it really a problem. So this is the challenge in reducing NAFLD-related mortality. Uh, risk assessment um, is so common, and very few people are identified. Of those who are identified, very few people are risk stratified. So you can't even start to target those people because you don't know who they are. So we need better risk stratification to match the prevention and early detection efforts. And then the issue of the absence of cirrhosis makes it really, really difficult. So even though you identify them and you risk stratify them, you're gonna have 20 to 30% who are gonna slip by. And therefore that's an area of, of major need and, and a gap in knowledge. So which brings me to screening. So based on what I've said, screening can be recommended, although there are no direct studies to that regard, can be recommended for those who have cirrhosis related to NAFLD. I think the studies show the magical 1% per year and some show even higher than 1% per year. Patients with NAFLD in whom non-invasive measures show evidence of advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis should be considered for HCC screening. Since liver biopsy is not a practical option, obtaining that bona fide uh, a confirmation is not a practical way of proving advanced liver disease. The question is about what about F3? And we can discuss this in the session. I think F3, F4, I consider that as an advanced liver fibrosis. Those in the absence of advanced liver fibrosis should not be routinely screened. Their risk of HCC is just way too low to justify it. So what about prevention? There is no curative treatment for NAFLD, so that's a problem. Do we have a chemo prevention? Something you can use in NAFLD may not cure it, but reduces the risk of HCC? Well, there may be promising agents. I spoke about diabetes as a risk factor. How about the treatment of diabetes in that metformin use, uh, multiple studies in this particular meta-analysis, eight of them seem to agree on a reduced risk of HCC among diabetics who are treated with metformin compared to other things, mostly insulin, a 50% risk reduction, no such reduction in sulfonylurea, and a possible increase among those who use insulin. No specific studies, prospectively at least, uh, uh, look at uh, dose, uh, effect, uh, predictable mechanism, prognostic biomarkers. So while this is promising because it's commonly used, uh, it hasn't reached a point where this could be used deliberately to reduce the incidence of HCC. What about statins? We conducted a study a long time ago showing that statins in a nested case control study among US veterans was associated with 37% risk reduction. Uh, since then, there have been so many studies done. This is results from a uh, systematic review that shows in general uh, there is something very close to what we mentioned in the study, 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.7 um, uh, relative risk, which means 30 to 40% risk reduction. Uh, there seems to be uh, a preference for simvostatin, but it's an area that is, I believe, ripe for clinical trials. Uh, statins have been shown to possibly lower uh, portal hypertension, maybe reduce the risk of variceal bleeding, and I think if we can identify a group that is a high risk of HCC, uh, testing statins uh, should be the next uh, wave to go. Uh, what about weight loss? Uh, these are results from a recent study published in gastroenterology that shows that successful bariatric surgery provides long-term resolution of NASH, regression of fibrosis. This is at uh, one year and five years uh, Will this be associated with the reduction of HCC? I would say most likely, but the numbers are too small 
uh, to prove it using one study and we need more data. But I think uh, by, by uh, extrapolation, this seems to be a very good idea uh, for uh, weight loss. So I've reached the end. I'd like to summarize. There are changing HCC risk factors. We have much less active hep C and hep B, at least in liver clinics. I'm not denying that they don't exist in the general population. We have much more metabolic dysfunction. The risk factors that are new related to NAFL, NASH, metabolic dysfunction, convey lower individual risk, but a lot more people at risk, which is a dilemma. The relative risk is modestly elevated, but the absolute risk is very low. We don't have much about determinants, but the most important determinant is cirrhosis. Next to it is abdominal obesity, NAFLD, and diabetes. When you talk about NAFLD, NAFLD to HCC is rare, but it happens, too rare to act on nowadays. NASH to HCC is infrequent, probably someone to act on by risk stratification and chemo prevention. NASH cirrhosis, at least 1% per year, screening and targeting for prevention is justified desperately. Knowledge are needed for better risk stratification, better knowledge about the effect of treating metabolic syndrome and the effects of HCC screening in cirrhosis. Uh, thank you very much again, and it's been a, a pleasure talking to all of you.